Welcome to the World Football Summit podcast, the show for football industry leaders who want to stay ahead of the game. We bring you the latest insights, trends, and stories from the experts driving innovation and progress in sports business worldwide. Join us as we dive deep into the ideas and initiatives transforming the world of football. From sustainability and innovation to player development, fan engagement, and everything in between. Our goal is to unite the global football industry and drive positive change and progress. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the World Football Summit podcast. I'm your host, Jaime, CMO at World Football Summit. We tend to think that the football industry is the one that evolves around the 11-man game playing in fields of grass in roaring stadiums. But nothing is farther from the truth. There are many modalities of football. And today, my guest on the show, Tycho Sullivan, and I deep dive into the beach football or soccer ecosystem, its role within the industry and its potential. He also tells us about his project, pro and Beach Soccer, including the origins, challenges, and how he ended up working with soccer teams of the MLS. This was a fun one, and you would be surprised at how closely linked both modalities really are. Before we go into it, though, don't forget to subscribe and read the podcast on your platform of choice and share it with your industry colleagues. You can also subscribe to our newsletter, where every week we send updates, trends, and everything that goes on at our events. You can find the link in the show notes. Remember, this 2024, we have events in London, Mexico, Sevilla. We have one in Maga coming up in a few weeks. You can check it all out on our website, and we hope to meet you there. And now, let's welcome Tygo Sullivan to talk all things beach soccer. Welcome to the World Football Summit podcast. It's great to have you here. I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised because, you know, I was mentioning in the intro how usually people don't understand beach soccer as part of the football ecosystem. But I think they're in, you know, as I said, in for a surprise. Uh, there's so many things that uh, link uh, with each other and I'm uh, excited to have you here. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, a pleasure to be here. So thank you. before we go into, as I said, this conversation, um, I was wondering if you can briefly introduce yourself. And I always like to ask my guests, uh, why didn't you decide to pursue a career in, in football or related to football? Sure. Well, my name is Tygo Sullivan. I am the proprietor of pro Ambi Soccer. I, soccer has been sort of something that has been in my, my DNA since an early age. I was part of the first sort of generation of players that came out of our world, our failed World Cup bid, which Mexico took, which had the creation of the NASL with Pele and Beckenbauer. And so in the 1970s, there was a big push for youth soccer in, in the U.S. I started at the age of six and at the age of 18, I was one of the first paid coaches in my community. And then along came the 94 World Cup and visions, future developments and my entrepreneurial you know, zest, you might say, just sort of pushed me in that direction since I was already, you know, making a fairly good living as a, as a paid soccer coach. And that just kind of transformed itself into other business entities. All right. And well, before those business entities, I did want to ask you a little bit about beach soccer, because I want to understand, and I want the audience to understand, you know, the, the, the current state, the potential importance it has worldwide. So I don't know if you can kind of give us a, a brief outline. Yeah, sure. Um, well, currently it's at one point it was the fastest growing sport period in the world. That's probably been taken over by like pickleball or something else these days. But, you know, currently there's 101 men's and 23 women's national teams. Of those, there are, a, you know, we have 195 total countries in the world and 114 of them are currently or have been uh, competing for a FIFA ranking. And in addition to that, there are recorded wise or understood on an international level, 193 men's clubs and 64 women's clubs that are competing in competitions. Now that doesn't actually include many that are not trying to be involved in that international scope. Uh, many of which you would find like at my events, which are more amateur level people that enjoy playing the game and are helping it grow from more of a grassroots level. So potential is fairly limitless. There are so many teams out there that are playing and there's so many leagues. I mean, Europe has sort of the ecosystem of, of growth nearly has every country, you know, whether 
mean, Switzerland, which is landlocked, has one of the best beat soccer cultures in the world. Um, Ukraine was a, a European champion. So it's not, as, as Cantonal once said, it's not about the, the beach, it's about the sand. And at this point, there are so many people playing the game, even at the professional level, let alone the amateur and youth levels, that there really are not enough competitions to, for them to be able to participate. So that's sort of where we've, we've come in with our organization trying to fill that gap. And going on from that, I mean, it is sort of like the perfect game for this new generation of younger adults. The X-Gens and the Millennials are perennially known for having, you know, the short attention span. With beach soccer rattling off a shot on goal every 30 seconds, an average of nine goals per game, no tie games. I mean, someone who may not like uh, soccer or football, I should be knowing my audience right now and not uh, Americanized or bastardized it by calling it soccer in some ways, but, you know, that can't watch a game for 90 minutes can fall in love with beach soccer and had that at the 2017 World Cup in Bahamas. I saw it firsthand where a gentleman from Trinidad Tobago was sitting next to me and just was talking about how he didn't enjoy, you know, watching football. And then at one point during the match, he disappeared. And when I found him later, he was like, I'm sorry I left you, but there was so much going on. I was missing it. I had to go up to the screens and watch the replays. It was so amazing. So that was sort of one of those opportunities where it really kind of galvanized the idea that this is a game that can be enjoyed by so many. And in addition to that, it's perfect for TV broadcasting, OTT platforms, you know, where it's, a nat it's, it's natural for commercialism and the fact that it has three periods that are 12 minutes each, with two minute periods in between for those much needed commercials. You know, you're able to compete or complete this game within an hour of, of a TV time slot in many cases. Now, if there's overtime and penalties and such, then, you know, that's where some of the complications may, may arise. But, you know, there's always post editing and things like that to, to make it work. So just in general, I mean, from a standpoint, to go back to your question, the game is growing. It's growing very fast. It's everywhere around the world whether you're talking the professional leagues in Japan or Brazil or all across Europe, it's the potential's already there. And, and the thing that's lacking is that sort of commercial push to get it in front of fans' eyes. Probably what you're missing is distribution. Huh? Yeah. yeah, very much so. And that's more uh, readily available now with OTT platforms. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's just really a, a situation of cart before the horse. You know, you need to have those uh, corporate partnerships to be able to pay for the crew to film it with from multiple angles to be able to then sell it to the OTTs. I mean, the OTTs are all starving for content. This is content that would be just devoured, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about it, the, the essence of the sport, as you said, I think it's interesting for new generations, which is something that the industry as a whole is wondering how to connect with that. And you said it, no, this is a very dynamic sport. It's, it has a high dose of quote unquote spectacular moves. And even if probably, even if you don't like football or soccer, you know, you mentioned that before. I mean, at the end of the day, to me, the, the name doesn't really matter to me. What, what is undeniable is that the soccer ball or the football is always the same. And that's what unites us. I agree. It will be re re referring to the term in conditioning here, either football or soccer. Um, but as I was saying, I think even if you don't like it, if you don't like football, probably you watch this and you're entertained, which is a good way to expand into new audiences, which is, I think is where the opportunity lies for beat soccer as a complement to the sport in general. That, that's what I would say. No, um, I, I would fully agree. I mean, it's become more and more. I'm, I'm going into my 20th year of doing events. It's It's been eye-opening to be perfectly honest. I mean, we got into this as to do something different and fun, but so many things have come out of it that I didn't realize. And one of it was how much people enjoy playing it. I mean, one of the things about our, you know, the events that we do is once a team that has never stepped foot in Sam before, once they do, they're, they're addicted. You know, they want to come back. I can't tell you how many clean uh, teams and clubs over the years had said that they play in the event and that's all they talk about. 
you know, even years after they talk about their experience going out with their team because of the team bonding and the, and, and everything mm -hmm. else that comes along with it. But as a sport, you know, the players just try harder and they are able to, you know, take on techniques and, and skill sets and even tactics that are very different, but they adapt back to the grass game full heartedly. Yeah, and you mentioned, for example, you have legends like Cantona, no? Yes. Uh, Cosmo wonders about, about beach soccer. And, and you talk about like many, many legends of the game and, and they always mention beach soccer as, as a, I don't want to call it a pastime because it's not a pastime, it's a different modality that I like to practice. Um, and I'm wondering, how does this complement the, I want to say traditional, 11-side football that, that people know? How, how does it fit within? Well, this is, this, this I've talked about on many occasions at the United Soccer Coaches Conventions for an hour itself. But I always kind of go back to Brazil with a Z is Brazil with an S for a reason. And if you look at most of the most dynamic and historical Brazilian players, they all had beach experience. So many of the Brazilian players are known for this sort of different swagger and approach and style, you know, the, the dance, the samba, you know, and maybe people want to attribute it to the music or, or what have you, but, um, at a younger age, you know, they don't see the opportunity of playing on the grass. You know, they, they're playing seven aside, five aside, futsal, street ball. I mean, Pele played with a sock rolled up in with, you know, string. And the one place that was always, they were always able to play was also the beach. Any time that you have a chance to manipulate the ball, it's going to improve your game. And I think there's a gentleman, his name is Koe Shikawa. Uh, he was, he grew up in Bolivia. He was Japanese born or Japanese Bolivian. And he grew up in the era with Marco Echeverri, you know, El Diablo, famous for getting the quickest red card, I think, in World Cup history in 94. But as part of the Toichi Academy in Bolivia, he now coaches professionally in Japan. And he summed it up best of all the types of football one can compete. Beach soccer, more than any other, by far takes more technique. It's without a doubt, the most tactical and street strategic one can play. And so from that aspect of it, the things that you're learning just are profound. And again, another uh, sage of beach soccer once said, like, you can be an amazing grass player, but that doesn't mean you're going to be a good beach player. But if you're an amazing beach player, it's going to translate to you being an incredible, incredibly skilled grass player. So just those sort of ideas is an automatic understanding of, of how it can translate. And from the standpoint of you know, I invented a, a saying called running in high heels, which is basically yeah. a technique of run, how you run in sand so that the sand compresses behind the arch of your foot instead of in front. So you're basically learning how to run on your toes to save energy in the sand and to become more efficient in the way that uh, you move. And you save energy and plus move like two and a half steps faster over, over 10 steps maybe three and a half, depending on who you are. But those, that technique also puts you in a situation when you go back to the hard surface that you naturally rise to your toes. So all of the plyometrics that are people are doing, trying to get young players to move to their toes, um, all the time spent without the ball is, you know, we've, we've had this as, as soccer coaches conversations for decades, you know, all this time lost because we're not, we don't have a ball at our feet. Well, with beach soccer, you always have it. You're working on building those twitch muscles, those the, everything from your ankle to your calves and to your knees, giving you stronger ligaments and um, and really building a a better base of not only endurance but in strength, but stability for for your body to be able to compete as well. So I'm thinking, you know this, and I'm probably sure that professional football teams on the traditional, you know, um, modality know this. Do you know, you know, so the audience can understand about how football clubs like, you know, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, Barcelona, how are all these clubs using beach soccer into their quote unquote training regimes? Sure. Well, I mean, you can, you can find it. Like, I mean, if you go to YouTube or you do a basic search for Real Madrid and sand or Barcelona and sand, or even Bayern, I mean, there are videos and everything basically showcasing it. I mean, from, from my standpoint. You know, my experience first seeing sand use was at Real Madrid. Uh, I took kids to their summer campus from 1999 to 2008. And that started on the old 
the old Real Madrid city near Plaza Castilla. And eventually, you know, during that period of time, Valdebedas was, was built. And alongside the main training field, and this was before I even got into beach soccer, they had a beach field and a football court. Now, Roberto Carlos and, and Ronaldo were there at the time, and I'm sure there was some influence and in understanding and discussions with the Brazilians that had been you know, going through Real Madrid for some time. But I mean, if you look at it, you know, during Christian Bale's time at Real Madrid, I mean, we saw him working in sand almost as much as on the field because he was recovering from some injury. And that being said, I mean, if you, re you remember the bike kick in the, in the Champions League final, I, you think he learned that on that hard, cold, wet surfaces of Wales or even in, at Tottenham in England? Of course he did it. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, it's like, let's <laughs> let's land on concrete or a, a muddy puddle. I mean, that it's not it's not a reality that he did that, but he was spending so much time on sand. And if we remember, who gave him that lofted ball that he finished? Oh, Ty, come on. You just, you just, uh, you know, debunked a bit a little bit for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, yeah, I know. It was Marcelo. Just kidding. I mean, the Brazilian. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, but you, you could tell, I mean, from the naked eye for myself looking at that, it was like, okay, well, we know that he was on sand all the time already. So what are you going to do if you're on sand and you're kind of playing around with a soccer ball? You're going to do beat soccer stuff. And a bike kick is paramount to, to the beat soccer game. And suddenly this oversized kind of, you know, obviously athletic specimen that is awkward, you would think in the air suddenly hits one of the biggest goals in Champions League history, you know, and it goes on from there. I mean, Bayern Munich's uh, former physical trainer, uh, Francesco Mauri, you know, he, he stated that sand was the focus, was a, a tremendous focus in their schedule. And I mean, this was during a period of time where they were winning championship after championship. And I think, I believe it was also when they won a treble. He went on to kind of describe how it helped in preventing injuries, shortening recovery times from injuries, treating, treating chronic injuries, uh, the strength training that was way more complete than working in a gym because it wasn't isolating muscles as weight machines and, and weights do, but giving a kind of a complete workout, the heart rising faster. I mean, anaerobic power and the aerobic power, anaerobic workouts. I mean, the list goes on to talk about working on balance, you know, both with the ball and without and improving coordination. I mean, it was all of these things. It, it's not rocket science. I mean, we've, I've had debates with many people that are high up in the traditional hard surface of grass, you know, our beloved 11 aside game. And they, they at first don't see it, but I've never lost the debate, you know, because you just can't fight logic, simple logic, you know, and in addition, you know, even going further, Barcelona is well chronicled in the, in their usage for coming back from injuries. You can just do a quick search and find photos of Iniesta, Messi, Suarez, Vidal, Pique, and many others, you know, using the sand um, to recover from their injuries and and to get back on the field quicker just because of the the lack of impact of of the uh, hard of the soft surface compared to what they would do if they were trying to recover in a hard surface you know like what i like uh, most about um all this conversation we just had is the passion that you have for the sport and how much you believe in it as a complement to the traditional, again, the traditional modality, if you will, no? For the 11 side played on grass modality, which kind of leads me to discuss a little bit about you and, and, and your project from Beach Soccer, no? So um, I was wondering if you could, um, you know, tell us what inspired you to launch the project and more importantly, what gap does it fill? What, why does the industry need a project like Brown Beach Soccer? Sure. Well, if you didn't, if you hadn't understood, I mean, I started as a grass coach. I've been coaching all levels from, you know, the youngest youth of three-year-olds to amateur men's doing it for over 35 years. And originally I got into beach soccer because you know, some people approached me and with an idea at the time, many people were asking me to do different sorts of entrepreneurial business things with me. And I would always ask, you know, put something on, put something in writing so that I can evaluate it. Nobody ever, nobody ever does that, you know, for the most part. So this was an opportunity where someone came to me with an idea. They put it in writing. It sounded fun. So we went with it and that was back in, started in 2004. And our first event took place in 2005 on the, actually the same period as the very first beach soccer FIFA, beach soccer world cup in 2005, which was 
actually won by Cantona and his uh, French team. But as I was doing this, I had the honor of being asked to be involved with the U.S. men's national team. I had the proper licensing to be able to coach at that level, although I didn't really have the experience of coaching beach soccer. I had a platform that at that time gave the opportunity of several players uh, in my community to actually go and play with the U.S. men's national team at the same time that I was able to uh, be, be part of it as an assistant coach. So since 2006, when that began, you know, very short after our first event, I've had a, a hand in probably over 20 players who are playing either on the men's U.S. national team or the women's national team, which just formed recently, and then many, many others who have had a look to see if they could make it. Originally, that was sort of my direction because I didn't really think about what became more of my direction was it being really from the beginning about the grassroots. You know, even more so, I, I realized that the players that I was supporting both in time and, and even financially have kind of short memories. And those players, especially in this new era of entitlement, really kind of confused me and, and disappointed me, you know, with the, that short memory. So the project has kind of gone full circle to the point now where eventually I realized this was more about exposing uh, youth coaches and youth players and getting them to be able to take advantage of what I believe expedites player development for the grass game. You know, they, by players that are being able to be exposed to sand at a younger level, it just advance quicker. You know, they play harder in the sand, the sort of old school Maradona complex where a kid just sits up top and waits to get the ball. You can't do that in the sand. You can't hide. So even those type of players because of the fact that they strive for, you know, winning, they can't do it in the sand unless they really work hard. So generally, you know, players that have this opportunity of being exposed to the sand, they play slightly differently. They, they develop different sorts of skill sets that you cannot get solely by playing on a hard surface. And I kind of, I, I, I not, um, how do I put it? I analogize it, I guess, to the point of having more weapons in your quiver that you can pull out, you know, being able to scoop, being able to chip with more gracefulness, you know, your touch out of the air is more su uh, subtle. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that you just don't learn on the grass that you can actually get in a beach training, but then again, translates 100% back to the grass game. So my reason is multifaceted why I got into this. It, I'd like to create a, a paradigm shift in the lower age groups and in, in development. And, you know, the professional clubs are using at the senior level. So why wouldn't we be doing this at the younger ages? So what I have done, you know, is great, basically created a, a, a situation to incentivize clubs to host events uh, by giving them a, a majority of the the net profits of my events in a short time period to not only create a, a situation where they can differentiate themselves from other organizations to hopefully attract more players, but also creating a, a scenario where these players have something to play for in the sand. And so therefore they'll spend more time and so we can help, you know, coaches learn how to do it and therefore the players can take better advantage of it. And then in addition to that, that gap that I was talking about earlier is, you know, creating more international cash prize based events for the senior teams to fill a void in the international experience. This, this is a lifestyle sport and there are plenty of people that are going out there playing for cash prizes that don't come nearly close to covering the actual costs of the event, but it's at that point, it's really kind of beyond the football. It's about the experience and the community that you find within beach soccer. Um, it's, it's, it's dynamic and it's more accessible than the main, you know, our main beautiful game of 11 aside, but even that barely scratches the surface of sort of the reasons why I've gotten involved in the sport. Yeah. I mean, it's good enough. And I like it, you know, it's dynamic, just like the sport itself. So, you know, you kind of like following the ethos of the sport. It's good to see. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know if you can describe a little bit, just, you know, briefly. You don't have to go into any numbers, just yes, for the people to understand how the sport business model works. Sure. So back in, I say back in the day, I mean, 
let's let's call it 10 years ago or maybe a little bit more because the pandemic kind of screws up my my calculations in time you could build an event and teams would show up but what ended up happening was that every tom dick and harry at least in the united states uh started putting on soccer tournaments you know they were a bit of cash cows i guess the market became very saturated to the point where you weren't being able to get uh, the same number of teams at your events. And for me, it was a scenario where like, whereas I could just build an event and, and teams would come because of, you know, the, uh, the nature of the event, it became to a point where coaches, one, weren't seeing the value in sending their players because they only saw it as something that was fun, but, um, also the quid pro quo of, Hey, you bring my teams, I'll bring my teams to your event. If you bring your teams to my event sort of surfaced to fill that situation uh, between organizations to make sure that they got all the teams they wanted. So even to this day, I mean, you're there, if you go to certain, if you're in a, in a certain club, you're going to see the same teams over and over again, no matter what tournament you go to, because those, that system of quid pro quo is in place. So during the pandemic, when, you know, I had already come to realize that previously I had to kind of reinvent what we were doing. And, and I was correct in doing so because as we came out of the pandemic, most of these brass coaches, and I, I do call many of them dinosaurs because they, they can't see the forest through the trees. They had the idea that, you know, we just lost three years. We need to spend more time on the grass and we need to get our, you know, development back on track. And I was just sort of sitting there going, well, you know, there's empirical scientific evidence clearly stating that you can exercise in sand and in sand and get one and a half times greater aerobic performance and two and a half times anaerobic performance. I mean, it's literally the most efficient way to get fit. And from the standpoint of technical ability, you know, you're talking about hitting balls off a, an uneven surface and most of the game being played in the air, if it's played correctly. And, you know, in the U S we had a fascination with Barcelona with a tiki taka and and, you know, to the point where recently I had the realization with my men's team that many of them had never even played in a 4-4-2 and didn't even know how to play a 4-4-2 because everything had shifted to the 4-3-3. And, you know, with, with that in mind, you just had this sort of, well, at least I had a, an awareness that, you know, they weren't being able to understand that they could catch up to those losses if they had put their players in the sand immediately because of the fact that, again, sand expedites player development. But in regards to the business model, which was really the question here, um, during that pandemic, I created a paradigm shift in the way that we approached it. I was looking to scale faster. You know, I wanted, you know, being able to do events previously, they were growing slower. So I decided to give away a large portion over 50% of the net profit over a period of years to the club to incentivize them to create a new event where they would be able to make money for their organization and then offer the organization how to coach those players and teach their coaches how to teach their players so that it becomes something that they, again, can aspire to, to do during the year. Um, we've also now created, in, in particularly in Texas, this will be the first year, but it's going to grow where there'll be a series of events over a short period of time in different cities where they can travel and actually do a circuit of beach soccer tournaments. So it creates almost a, a summer program where before there was none, you know, there was, you know, nobody does anything in the summer, you know, whether you're in Europe or whether you're in the U.S., that's the time period where burnt out coaches take their rest. But from the standpoint of development, the players are, and their parents are still looking for something to do. So this is a, the opportunity for our organization to spread the game wider and quicker to you know, fully develop possible national championship, which we last did in 2019 and are and hoping to bring back in November this year. But from the biggest standpoint, it's, it's creating a, a paradigm shift where it goes from grass, the futsal, then usually back the grass again, and now we'll have beach. And I would almost stake my entire reputation and, and everything on the fact that those players that train in the summer in the sand are going to come back in the fall and be much more dynamic, stronger, less prone to injury, and excel beyond those that did not. So that's, that's sort of the how the, the model works is 
just an incentivizing package. And we're hope we're going to be able to see we've we've seen it with one one organization, and now we've got several others that are um, MLS Next, and you know these other acronyms that we have for youth soccer in the U.S. now taking charge of it, and we'll see over the next few years how this works. Yeah, it's a little statement there, you know, about the players coming back in the wall and and saying you know, and they're going to be better. I still respect your time because you know, um, I don't want to I don't want to take too much of your time, tight, but you could highlight maybe just like one challenge and one opportunity, one that you have faced while building this from the ground up. What would sure. I know it's difficult because this is like a puzzle. This this is true. like isolated, never happens. But you just have that one. I, I think, I mean, from the standpoint of challenges is the things that you find anytime in business. You know, you've, you've got the unappreciative people, you've got the thieves, you've got the copycats, you've got the naysayers, you know, plenty of bad actors out there, you know, people at the end of the day who tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. These are all fairly common things. I wouldn't, I don't want to put any one finger on pointing out, but they all happen and you've got to fight them because in your own mind, you know, I think the biggest challenge is, is believing in the, in the crusade or the direction that you're going because many times it'll manifest itself in maybe some aspects of imposter syndrome, you know, or whatever else it might be, but these things pass, you know, time experience, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I wouldn't say that there's been any one challenge that has been, that has significantly hindered me, but there have definitely been things that have slowed me down. From a standpoint of opportunities, that's also something that's been so plentiful. I mean, all the great friends that I've made within the community, the mentors that have helped shape my mind, um, and, and obviously, you know, the honor of being able to represent my country on the sideline, even though I wasn't nearly as experienced as I am now. I mean, the job I would do now would be a thousand times better than what I was doing then, but just being able to have the platform for so many of the players to be able to then go on to represent our country is something that I feel very honored to have been involved with and continue to with, with those that pass through and very grateful for. Not only that, I mean, the impact that you've created in the community, I think it's also remarkable. Um, and you haven't highlighted yet, but I think it's important for the audience to understand that this is, as in football, this has its business side, but it also, you know, has its social side. So I was wondering if you could also briefly describe what type of community impact that you know, the project is having, you know, again, just small detail, just give the audience a sense of what you're accomplishing here. Sure. I mean, from an economic standpoint, every event that we do, you know, from a tourism standpoint, uh, raises the bar for a city. I mean, as an example, the, the place we started, which was Santa Cruz, California, uh, which actually now happens to be one of the biggest producing cities of U.S. men's national team players since the early 2000s. You know, we had an average of 160 teams from 2010 to 2019. Conservatively, we brought in $2.75 million for a one, for a two day, one weekend event. You know, it's in the tourism industry, it's, it, they, they call it heads and beds, you know, getting those heads in the beds to create the tax revenues for the cities to be able to, you know, grow and, and operate and create more services. So each event that we do has that sort of impact that helps create programming of a variety of sorts as it goes into their general funds. In addition to, you know, our, our partnership program is the easiest way to answer the question, you know, but by providing, you know, an opportunity for a club to financially gain from it and expose kids to it, to have this different approach, you know, these events can make a sizable five figure income for a club. And not only that, then improve their player development and overall success as an organization. We believe that beat soccer helps with the burnout as well. Like so many players, especially in the United States, you know, they, they get to a certain age and, you know, they're tired of the competition. They're tired of the traveling. This game is, you know, as, 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 uh, as it was reported by FIFA at some point, you know, this is the celebration of the beautiful game. It's not just the beautiful game, but it's the celebration of it because of the exorbitant, like acrobatic bike kicks and strikes out of the air. And in addition, you know, we obviously, as an organization, we never deny a team or club, you know, that's financially strapped. We will find a way of being able to get them to play in our events 
as long as they can kind of go through the vetting process and not try and not trying to take advantage of us, which also happens on a pretty wide scale. So we develop very close relationships with these clubs and these organizations. And in general, the international community is, is very much attainable. And, um, it's an amazing group of people, you know, all across the board. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, we were discussing about how different, um, professional football clubs have embraced beach soccer as a methodology to train their players. Um, have you been able to approach or work with, uh, MLS teams? Just out of curiosity or any other league? Well, we've talked to some of the professional leagues about developing, you know, beach soccer leagues to complement their own 11 aside. We haven't quite got there yet, but when it comes to MLS, the Kansas City Sporting Organization is the only one that I know of that, you know, utilizes sand in really any capacity. Now, my knowledge of MLS, I sadly have to say, is not as good as, let's say, La Liga, even though I'm from the U.S. Obviously, everyone knows that we're becoming stronger by, you know, annually, I guess. But Kansas City actually has a beach soccer field at their training facility, and I'm of keen knowledge that their head coach uh, is a believer in it. For my influence, you know, where I'm from, it's the San Jose Earthquakes. You know, they've had some academy youth teams compete in our events with success, but it, again, it was only something that was for fun. You know, they mostly utilize us as a as a marketing opportunity to promote their 11 aside games and things like that. So no, I mean, MLS, they're not, they haven't bought into the, uh, what everybody else is doing on a successful level, as far as I know. Now take it with a grain of salt. I could be wrong, but I have not been able to find anything through my research. And okay. And is working with them part of the goals that you have the project or put it another way, what are the ambitions that you have for the project? Very briefly again, what I mean, because I guess you have many. Yeah, I mean, that's a, an open-ended question that I'll try and keep simple, but it would, be, it would be great to work with MLS organizations or even getting them to work with others that are within our community. You know, as whereas I was a kid that grew up as a six-year-old and never really had a, a truly good professional coach until I was 17, and then as an 18-year-old, I was better than pretty much all the coaches I had as a youth. That transition's happening now, even with beach soccer, where the younger uh, the younger generation is now becoming coaches. So there are a lot more opportunities of finding people that know how to teach the sport. And many of them may have more influence or connections or, you know, it's not always what you know, but it's who you know and and the impression you make on them. So these individuals may have even more of an impact on these MLS organizations. So it would be great to see them buying into the logic, let's just say. You know, it's not rocket science. But for ourselves, I mean, we're right now mostly focused domestically on the post-pandemic partnership model that we just spoke about. But at the same time, you know, the eye is always on the international. My background is international business. I've been to nearly 50 countries and I've I now been to six World Cups or you know, six World Cups and four World Cup finals. I mean, it's just sort of like something that I've been passionate about doing and so the, the idea for the long-term ambition is on the global scale is bringing the OTT and the broadcasts back. Like, you know, in Spain, you would maybe remember this in the early 2000s, you know, Tele Deporte used to do, you know, beat soccer and showcase it. And it, the, the stadiums were always full and electric. I remember you know, full energy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was kind of like what they called like, you know, uh, what was it? ESPN Ocho, you know, or these other alternative sports stations that are that are giving you sort of regional sports. Those are more plentiful now than they were in the early 2000s. And they're all starving for content and we're just not providing it. And so I'd like to be able to be part of that sort of reinventing renaissance, you might say, and, and bringing beat soccer back to more of a worldwide audience through uh, streaming, streaming live matches and having them being able to walk, be able to be watched by a wider audience because it has more appeal even now than it would have been in the early 2000s for a player that can't, or for a fan or even a non-fan of, of football who can't sit through 90 minutes. We're talking about an hour where you're going to see bike kick after bike kick after sidewinder after volley after, you know, so many, so many shots that are just going to be tantalizing to, you know, the, the, the occasional passerby that will get sucked into the sport. So I want to be part of what makes this game more accessible and more widely watched. And by 
producing these international events like the one we'll be doing this year in in September in Puerto Rico, you know, we'll give people the opportunity of of not only participating in the event from a from a wider stance because not many of the international clubs have an opportunity to play against teams around the world. They mostly are regionalized in Europe or South America, but it also let the world see it. I'm wondering in today's world, I mean, every sport uses technology some way or the other. It's, in, it's unavoidable. And one of the, I guess, things that surprised me most when we spoke uh, preparing for this conversation is how you guys are using digital mapping and augmented reality, which to me, at least, it was surprising. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit, you know, I know there's, again, so many details. It's an open-ended question to probably would do for a podcast episode in itself. But if you could just give the audience kind of like a, a, a brief description of how you guys are using these type of technologies to enhance the, the experience. Sure. Well, I mean, my uh, intern, Agusti, that introduced us, um, loves your podcast from the standpoint that this is all about business. You know, the thing about what we do, one of the most dynamic things, besides putting on events that bring millions of dollars to communities, using technology that can very well create a paradigm shift in the way that sponsors and partnerships interact with spectators and and um, and those uh, those sponsors. So back in 2015, uh, one of our partners that creates lines for us called Porta Fields, um, it's an elastic line that we use for all of our lining of beach soccer events, came to me and asked me about beta testing an app for, you know, events. And, and I, and I agreed and we started doing it and it, it's, you can find it, it's at eventwizard.live and that became tclc.live as well as emapx.live. Over time, we, we developed it to the point of four, in four years that we started using it exclusively for our events full time, essentially making our events paperless and, and also more sustainable because we've always been, you know, I'm from California where we're, we're, we're where our mindset is sustainability and, and green and trying to use less resources. And, you know, after going through many of the kinks, we, we found an opportunity to provide that from a sporting level for any sport, you know, tournaments and events. And then the pandemic hit and it kind of was good and bad. It basically stopped us from continuing to expose the technology that we were working on, but it allowed us to really focus on it during the, the downtime and following the pandemic, I started going back to my sports conferences, which I go to about, you know, six or seven a year. And we have every sport and every aspect of tourism, CBBs and everything. And, you know, we're, we're share we share ideas and we network and we try and figure out what best practices are. And I went to sports Congress in Texas and I went to tech Tuesday. Because and this was the first conference that I was going to introduce our technology to these peers that I had been meeting with for several years and never exposed them to it. And all the talk was very succinct. It was about metadata for sponsors and experientialism for the attendees and that you must separate yourself and create a competition that is different than everyone else so that when they leave, whether it's a sponsor or any sort of partnership that you may have or an attendee that they talk about and they remember it so that they're going to come back. Well, this is, you know, Sora was our mantra, you know, even going into the conference. But after this hour long talk where, you know, I literally wrote down about four words, which was surprising because I was going to figure out what we were missing. And what I realized is that we were light years ahead of everyone. And I walked up to them and said, well, Here's our metadata from 2015, which we tabled. And here's our digital mapping. And by the way, we're using AR, like augmented reality and UX experiences and showed them some examples on my phone of the different uh, augmented reality. And their, their, their jaws just dropped. They were like, they'd never seen anything like it. They hadn't even imagined it. And, you know, we were basically in uh, creating a, a basic metaverse of sorts at our events where sponsors can have more authentic conversations, achieve real data in a way that they've never been able to do. And the participants were leaving having experienced something that they can't experience anywhere else, at least at this time. Now, this is changing since we're, you know, obviously pushing the technology out. But even to this day, you know, 
our organization luckily had the foresight of agreeing to beta test this. And now I've got a position where I'm working on strategic partnerships for this organization. And we're um, trying to stay ahead of the technology, looking at the AI and everything else. And, you know, we're, we're really happy with where we are because we know at this moment in time, we're still far, far ahead of anyone else. But the interesting thing about this is that this technology is not only applicable to the sport, if I'm not mistaken, you can, you can transfer this to other type of industries to you, right? Yeah. I mean, and that was always really sort of the case for us. I mean, within my organization, we're sort of what's called the rights holders. We're the ones that own a, a league or own a tournament and, you know, whether it's baseball, basketball, volleyball, you know, hurling, Gaelic football, if you want to throw my Irish aspects in there, we can create a, a system through our technology that will give you the opportunity of recording live scoring through watches and through phones and posting them on augmented scoreboards uh, live. And, you know, that aspect is sort of like a foundational piece, but it's also for CVBs, like city visitors, bureaus, you know, tourism, you know, creating, uh, you know, creating mapping, digital mapping that will allow people to do pub crawls or, and be able to map themselves from one place to another or points of interest. We've got a lot of other things that I, you know, can't or won't share at this time because I don't want to give away the, you know, give away the bag for free, as my wife says. Um, but beyond the tourism and the, and all of that, then there's conventions. We created a convention app and became the official convention app for United Soccer Coaches, which is the largest soccer convention, I believe, in the world you know, with, you know, 11 to 12,000 people annually. And we've had over 15,000 downloads of the app. Um, we created this app. Well, basically I go to all these other conferences and they all pretty much suck, uh, for the most part, not all of them, but many of them. And I took all the best pieces and we developed those pieces and put all the best into ours and then had some things like adding, a, um, adding a few features that you won't find at conventions that create more opportunities for the convention actually to, to make more money. And then be, and beyond the conventions, there's, you know, stadiums and arenas and multi-sport complexes. You know, we've, we've developed, um, ideas and haven't moved on all of them yet, but about digitizing the stadiums and, and creating a user experience when, when fans show up that they can pr prepare beforehand to find the bathroom, find where to buy that craft beer compare, compared to a cruise compo, let's say. And beyond that, it's kind of limitless. You know, like I am a believer of like, you can think it, you can make it happen, but generally we've focused on the, the tourism of the CVBs, the city visitors, bureaus, and tourism boards, the conventions, stadiums, arenas, multi-sport complexes, and the right holders, those leagues, no matter what they are. Interesting. Thank you for that. I, I know we're running out of time, um, but I think there's, there's one question that I need to ask you as a fan of the game. Um, do you get twos, an all-time five-man lineup, or a pro soccer player, or of, of pro soccer players to play a league soccer game? Who would you choose? Yeah. Now these are pro players, not beach players, because I was trying to figure out which one you were choosing on that. I'm thinking about the traditional or the 11 mana side model. Okay. So you could take five players in history and say, I'm going to put you guys together and I'm going to put you to compete in beach soccer. Okay. Well, I would first of all choose Cantona, the big man. Um, having met him and, and seeing his size as someone as a target and as a hero to the sport, you know, in the way that he's helped it grow, not just through his swagger and his words and his antagonism, but just in general, you know, like I said, in the beginning of this podcast, Cantona was, it's not about the beach, it's about the sand because it's accessible to everyone. You know, as a huge fan of it, I would be hard, this hard not to choose him. Uh, in addition, I would choose Ronaldinho based on a theory that, you know, futsal grew in the U.S. when YouTube became mainstream and you could find Ronaldinho's videos of him playing futsal as a youth, but many of those skills that he displayed that separated him from the other futsal players were actually beach technique. And he's a huge, huge sand fan, has a foot volley court in his backyard. So from a dynamicism of his ability to, to do so, at, especially in his prime, he would be perfect. Uh, Romario, who I believe was a golden boot in 94 World Cup. Um, another, oh no, no, he was second. 
I, I have to correct myself. My my histori- historic knowledge failed me there for a second. But Romario played on the Brazilian national team. Another huge football league guy um, would be very impactful to, to my <laughs> starting five. Currently, it would be Ederson, the goalkeeper for Man City, I would take. Uh, another Brazilian. There's a pattern forming here. Yeah. And then finally, not necessarily. I mean, he had the chance to play and did play professionally, but he ended up going the route of beach would be Amarelli from Spain, who was by far my most favorite player to coach against and to watch. Mm -hmm. I scouted the Spain team during the 2007 World Cup and uh, watched their training sessions to figure out what what we could do against them and just watching Amarelli train. And he was the one that really brought the bike kick to a new level. So that would be my five. Cantona, Ronaldinho, Romario, uh, and, and Edison, and, and Amarelli. If they ever did a movie like Space Jam, but adapted to beat soccer, I think this would be a great, you know, yeah, I think lineup to stop, to stop the aliens. No. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and to your point, at eight, the top scorer in the 94 World Cup, Stoichkov was up there. I don't know if it was top. It was Stoichkov, I'm pretty sure. And it was, and it was also Selenko. I would say, but I don't know if he ended up up there. I don't know. I don't remember. Well, that's why uh, I, I was at that game. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I was at that game. And that's a big asterisk because you got to take into account that, you know, the goalkeeper for Cameroon, I mean, that was a five, he scored five goals oh. in the game. And the goalkeeper oh, yeah. for Cameroon quit. There was a lot of, there's a, that's a whole nother yeah. podcast story. But that, yeah. That's, that, that's a podcast series or yeah. show. Yeah. About kind of, you know, anyway. Yeah, that, that game was played in our home stadium, and and I found out a lot of stories about that. In in afterwards, we had a friend that was uh, taking around the delegation, and it's not it's not a story for here and now, but it's very interesting and sad. Oh, I'm going to give it a thought to, like, a thought to a second podcast about yeah. <laughs> stories from the World Cup. And we take. I want to thank you so much because it's been just like this a fun conversation overall. I've enjoyed it so much. I'm pretty sure the audience has as well. But I'm wondering before we go. Are there any last words, any messages that you want to share with the audience? Anything that we haven't discussed that you want to? Yeah, I just want to actually go back to one of the things that you had mentioned earlier about, you know, our ambitions. You know, I I think the biggest thing was, is I I was lucky enough to go to the Qatar World Cup, uh, Qatar World Cup in 2022. And part of the reason I went was to see the kind of technology that they had. I wanted to kind of do a measuring stick and seeing where that, what was being used. I had, I had figured that it was going to be, there was going to be no expense, you know, not taken to bring this idealistic experientialism to the World Cup. And uh, I wanted to see everything tech. And now outside of the the game AR experience in stadium experience, which my phone, no matter what I did, never got it to work with my iPhone 11. I can't speak to that. What I, what I realized is that, you know, what we're doing as an organization is far was far more advanced than what even the World Cup had in 2022. So going back to that ambition thing that you were talking about, we'd like to see our technology being used as a as an opportunity to create a better World Cup experience and a better Olympic experience and, and create a fandom um, where we can create interests and points of interest for them to go to and and almost not necessarily control the the pathways, but incentivize people to have a better experience when they're not in match play. And, you know, the, the thing about that on the tech side is, is sort of a dream, but for the beat soccer, you know, it's, it's a great place for partnerships. You know, the fan base takes it more personally. There's a psychological ownership. You know, the players are much more available for, for the fans and the VIPs. You know, we, it's, it's a very strong connection that, you know, where there are meaningful memories being created. And again, with Puerto Rico coming, you know, we're working with Discover Puerto Rico and the actual Puerto Rican FA, which is utilizing this event to kick off their beach soccer, um, as a nation, um, is is something that we're looking forward to sharing with the world and obviously i'll invite anybody out there that uh, wants to have a, a stake in it the opportunity and, and and or just a discussion because beat soccer is something that's incredible and it's only going to get better in a way it reminds me a little bit to women's football when you say that you know players are more accessible fans they're really engaged 
I think it's the connection it can create with the audience is is higher. These are similar dynamics you see in women's football. So I mean, anybody out there, I would just you know encourage them to follow along and and see where the sport goes. And and then obviously eh, projects that like yours uh, ride that way for men and hopefully you know. So anyway, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you so much. This has been fun. Um, hopefully we'll bring you back. You can tell us a lot more about the sport, about your project, about everything that you guys are up to. And um, and hopefully, yeah, this will be. I mean, it's been a it's been a true pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about this passion of, of mine, both on the beach soccer and the tech side. So uh, anytime I, I look forward to our next opportunity to, uh, you know, have the gift of gab, you know, be shared amongst us. We will. And of course, uh, we need to thank Iosti for this, uh, for setting this conversation up. Uh, we need to remember him and, and hopefully he listened to the end. Let's see. Let's test it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and we'll, we'll speak soon. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Have a good day. And there you have him, Tycho Sullivan. This was a fun one, but uh, let me try to summarize the main takeaways for me. First of all, I really like the way he was looking at how beach soccer has limited, limitless potential. At the end of the day, it's a sport that has, you know, all it needs to have to engage new fans. It's spectacular. It's short. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, a, it's very dynamic at the end of the day, which is what the fan of the day really, really wants. But then when you think about it, the legends of the game are the first that are actually embracing and talking wonders about the sport. Look at Erin Cartona, Ronaldinho. I mean, and hey, even clubs like Real Madrid, like Bayern, like FC Barcelona, they're all incorporating beach soccer into their training regimes. So again, you should look at how it links with the entire ecosystem. All right. But then I also like the way he was t talking about the different challenges um, of growing a business around this sport. You know, it's it's not easy, but at the end of the day, football does need these new uh, modalities to flourish and to, you know, between all of us, grow the game of football, regardless of whether you play in a beach, you play in a stadium, wherever. At the end of the day, football is football, and we all need it to use it as a common language. And in fact, look at the, you know, community impact that they're creating. That's That's what football needs to drive. We believe that at World Football Summit, you know, football needs to be more than a business. It also needs to create social impact. And Prong Beach Soccer is a good example of that. All right. And really, that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. You know, as always, if, you know, anything else stood out to you, let us know. Uh, reach out on social media. And uh, before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your platform of choice. Share it with your industry colleagues. And nothing else. I want to thank you for tuning into this episode of the World Football Summit podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. And of course, have a great rest of your day and hope to see you next time.